The Business of Cleaning, the podcast that brings cleaning industry expertise straight to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Business of Cleaning. My name is Haley Morris. I'm your podcast coordinator and host, and today I have with me Ben Walker. I'm going to let Ben introduce himself, and then we're going to jump into today's episode. Hello, uh, my name is Ben Walker. I'm the principal consultant for uh, Management Inc. I'm an instructor for Janitor University, uh, and I am a columnist for Facility Cleaning Decisions Magazine. Um, I'm a cancer, uh, I like skiing, and I collect my <laughs> All right, uh, skiing, snowboarding, you're a winter sports person, right? Yes. Ben and I had a great talk, so we've spent a little time getting to know each other, but now Ben is going to uh, really help us explore more about, we're going to kind of dive into uh, people today, aren't we? Um, sure. Because what else other than people make your business go round? And one of the big things that we've saw with the last couple of years and even long before that is sometimes it's hard to get people to stick around. And so... I think today um, there's a lot of different ways we can break this down and take it, Ben. Um, but I'm just curious from your side, when it comes to retention of team members um, within this industry, some of the like some of what you've noticed throughout your career. Yeah. So uh, one of the things, and and you nailed it uh, with your introduction to the question um, that uh, we deal with, especially in professional cleaning, is that Cleaning is still one of the uh, uh, key professions in the facilities world that is human propelled, uh, meaning, um, you know, a good chunk of the time spent doing uh, the cleaning uh, work is done with human motion. A good chunk of the, of the um, you know, the, it's, it's a very t- tough piece to automate, even though, you know, some of those things are coming. Uh, but, uh, by and large daily cleaning is very much human propelled. And so, um, one of the things, uh, that we have to consider is that human beings aren't robots and human beings, especially in trades like cleaning, um, you know, are very much, uh, coming in with their own, uh, you know, with their own, um, uh, quirks, uh, that we have to figure out how to, um, you know, not necessarily manage, but how we can uh, engage people in a way to keep them uh, in in uh, in our in our operations, um, because as we know, uh, retention has always been a big thing in custodial. Um, you know, when I came into the industry, uh, you know, 17, 18 years ago, one of the big numbers that got bandied around was that uh, it's 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 not terribly uncommon to have uh, uh, turnover rates at 300 percent. Um, and by and large, a lot of that is, um, because of the nature of the work, uh, by and large, a lot of that is because of the culture of cleaning. And I think one of the biggest things, um, is that cleaning work up until the pandemic was invisible, meaning, um, it was a function that everybody assumed happened in the facility. Uh, it was a function that people, uh, had, had not a whole heck of a lot of understanding about not only what was going on, but who was doing it. Um, And I think a lot of times um, there is uh, an unspoken uh, expectation of how to articulate this servitude uh, between uh, occupant and person that's doing the cleaning inside the building. Yeah, I would definitely say, um, you know, it's not the only industry with that crazy turnover. I've worked for a call center before, and I know that because of the nature of the work and that you have to have somebody in that job, it's really hard hard to um, bring in recruiters who can hire people who aren't just going to walk out despite the tedious um, and usually underappreciated nature of the work. Uh, I can say that because I've hired for a call center where the job was scripted and it was boring. And honestly, like if you are someone who needs high uh, emotional stimulation or mental stimulation to keep interest in a task, you would have hated the job. Um, So we saw high turnover and I was always pleased that most of my people came and stayed, but I really dialed down on trying to find somebody who understood that that type of work 
uh, was going to be what it was and where um, what they could do with that for in the cleaning industry you know you can work up with this particular job there wasn't a lot of supervisory roles you could potentially get there but the likelihood is it would have been a part-time job it would have been very boring you would have come in for four or five hours a day uh, called a lot of people half of which when they answered were not nice because they didn't want to be on the phone I would yeah. have gone home um, and you know, what's interesting about that job is we had a cleaner who uh, cleaned the common areas who I I knew and I talked to every day I got out. She's one of my favorite people there because she was always great conversation. And I think she got a kick out of the fact that I absolutely refused to walk on her wet floors and I would dodge the mats uh, and play a small game of the floor as lava just to avoid putting footprints all over. Um <laughs> So I think she got a kick out of that. I think I was, she found me abusing. But um, even in that environment, it's hard because people walk past her every day. And I was probably one of two people that said hi to her in a room yeah. full of hundreds. Um, it, so it is, it's not the only industry, but it is one that has only started to see public appreciation more recently, or at least more awareness with us coming to a stage where we realized how important cleanliness is and it's not something that just gets done uh, because a lot of people went from an office that's cleaned for them to a home office that is not. So. And I would add, um, and it's a very astute point, the thing that I would add is cleaning is a fundamental job skill regardless of what you do. It's the first thing most of us learn, whether or not we're doing retail or food service or um, so, you know, if you're like me, my first job was a custodian at a high school. Um, but by and large, cleaning is a large component of what most people um, are getting introduced or, or how most people are introduced to the socioeconomic food chain. The thing that, um, you know, the thing that uh, happens is especially with, um, you know, uh, especially with, uh, you know, cleaning operations, is that a lot of times, you know, we're recruiting not only a multilingual workforce, we're recruiting a multicultural workforce, we're recruiting a multi-able workforce. And so, you know, it's one of these things that there, there are unique challenges and a lot of things that, you know, one of the biggest things that um, I see that, that people have struggles with uh, in their cleaning operation in particular, in ter especially in terms of retention, is that they feel like if they come up uh, or they come in, um, regardless of who they are or where they're from, if they come in, um, there's only so far they can go and there's only so far uh, laterally they can go. And, um, and a lot of times people will bounce kind of from job to job. And one of the things that didn't really happen uh, pre-pandemic, I've started to see this a little bit and it's actually very encouraging, is that cleaning was a thankless job. Um, it just was. Uh, it happened when the building was significantly unoccupied. People would just expect that the cleaning fairies come out and, and, and do their magic. And, you know, to the point where I, I, I still see this and I've, you know, it's been actually very interesting for me to get back out into the field for the past year. Um, you know, people by and large uh, who are occupants of the building have very little um, understanding of, of what actually uh, the cleaning department does uh, every, single, every single day. And so they come in with these expectations. And some of these expectations are, you know, um, you know uh, I think a bit outlandish. Um, the, the one thing that um, every uh, building seems to have is a potato chip person um where they throw a potato chip under the desk and start the timer on how long it takes for the cleaning department to come in and grab it yep <laughs> you're rolling your eyes and it's absolutely uh you're absolutely right to do it um and so there's this there's this um the huge disconnect i've noticed in what we say we're doing versus what we're actually doing versus what people think we're doing versus what people can expect from us and i think one of the major things with retention is um you know uh, entry level cleaning work is not, you know, it, it's not the highest paid uh, job you can get. And, and most people um, nationwide are averaging somewhere 12 to $14 starting out. Um, I know that some people have unionized and gotten those starting uh, rates up to 18. 
Um, but it's not just, you know, that's one of the things that I always point out is, is salary can be a motivator just as much as it can be a demotivator. And so one of the things that really, um, that I really um, like to uh, keep in context is, um, have you ever, you're, you've got an HR background. Did you ever, um, uh, did you guys ever study Frederick Hertzberg um, and, and organizational hygiene? Um, it sounds familiar. I have a collection of ones from like my HR management class uh, okay. that I may or may not have read at the time. <laughs> it's okay. One of the things, you know, so Frederick Hertzberg, so this goes back to like the late 60s, early 70s. It was actually, he printed a thing uh, or he ran a thing in the Harvard Business Review. And I guess it's one of their most, um, one of their most often duplicated, um, you know, uh, stories. And it was all about um, the two, was it the, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this, the two factor, uh, the two factor theory, or um, hang on, I'm going to make sure I've got it in front of me. So I'm not lying to you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's called the two, the two factor theory. Um, and basically, um, it's what motivates people uh, in working conditions. And so one of the things, the thing that um, motivates workers the most isn't salary or any, anything uh, that, that a lot of times in people in management assume motivates workers. It's things like acknowledgement, um, you know, uh, for, for milestones met, feeling like they're part of the team, um, and, and a feeling like they're actually contributing something. And, you know, and so a lot of times when we do these, when we teach uh, janitor to university, um, we'll put, you know, we'll put the survey up and kind of say, okay, what do you think is the biggest motivator for people in the job without, you know, without fail, managers always tell us, well, salary is the biggest motivator. Well, what we find actually is if acknowledgement and, you know, achievement and feeling like they're part of the team and, you know, and having tangible goals and direction aren't being met, then salary becomes the biggest demotivator. And so a lot of times what will happen is people will start looking at salary as a demotivator and they'll move away from the organization and into other pieces. And so it gets down to, well, what can we work with? Um, and and one, of the thing that, one of the things that is by and large missing in most cleaning operations that I start working with um, you know, uh, is, is that not only is there not a whole heck of a lot of, of, of training with teeth, meaning, um, it's usually some sort of uh, uh, tribal knowledge uh, collection of literature going back to the 80s and the 70s, but it's also been handed down generally, generationally throughout, uh, throughout the life cycle of the, uh, of the, uh, of the organization. Um, not only is that not, um, you know, is, is lack of initial training a, a big thing, is, is by and large, most cleaning operations managed by complaint. Uh, meaning they'll take care of the squeakiest wheels. Um, they do kind of, uh, you know, they do plot, kind of plot out what they hope to maintain. But one of the, one of the things a lot of cleaning operations will fall into is managing their biggest complainers. And when you do that, uh, you're not only not setting an expectation for daily cleaning, you're also setting, setting um, a precedent that people uh, can help you manage your, uh, your cleaning operation. And so when that happens, um, you know, the, the culture of the cleaning operation, especially with the workers and the workforce, is that, you know, uh, basically we're here to take care of complaints. This is an invisible job. Uh, they stick us in closets, uh, you know, and, and forget about us. And then we have to come out and try to get everything done um, with this big abundant list that's really tough to manage. And that's, you know, that's been a big universal thing that I've, I've seen pre and post, uh, post pandemic. So, um, you know, and so that's, that's really one of the biggest things that um, when an organization starts seeing retention and starts really tackling like, well, we want to have people that last, it's usually when they um, put in very, you know, uh, very thorough training pieces, uh, when they're not just handing people keys, uh, or pointing them to a closet or pointing them to a cart, uh, and saying, you know, here's your keys, keep your area clean and work hard. Um, some people don't even get that. And so by and large, when you start investing in people with uh, things like training and safety uh, and acknowledging that people have hit these milestones, it's, it's really when um, we see retention numbers start to increase. And I talk a lot, so I'll shut up. <laughs> no, I, 
I mean, I've seen that in different, in a lot of different ways. You know, you see it when it just comes to, uh, okay, we're, we're, we're always on crisis management level, yep. which means there's a lot of other smaller fire drills slipping through the cracks that becomes crises later. And you overwhelm yourself to the point where by the time you lost the staff, you're unprepared for that. Um, yep. And you're just never going to get out from under that technique unless you let a couple of those fall through the cracks so you can get back ahead of the game, which mm -hmm. is uh, working with the people, working with the people yeah. themselves and not just uh, focusing on, you know, some a lot of times like they're not even big things. It's just somebody's loud or mm -hmm. uh, it seems important up front, but you, you didn't assess before diving in and it's really not. Um, I know one of the things kind of coming with that, you, you got people walking out the door or things like that. Whenever you're looking at um, a, a team member, one of the things, my dad's actually been one of our guests on the show, uh, comes nice. with a strong background at HR. Um, so I pick his brain a lot and I brought him on to pick his brain for the show. And he, he, one of his main things that he said to me is that uh, if the first time you know somebody is they're leaving, is their exit interview, then you messed up. You know, that um, it, it goes back to what you said at the beginning, uh, those um, like stages of need and priorities with the employee. And there are so many different, I think, variations, um, a couple ones that have stood out, but essentially like make sure your employees' base needs are met. And sometimes this is a fit thing. If mm -hmm. you're hiring for a part-time role that only makes so much an hour, there are going to be a lot of people who won't stay because the pay isn't going to be enough to supplement what they need. Like if somebody needs full-time employment and you can only offer part-time, they're not the right fit for you. Nope. But if somebody needs additional income or a job on the side, those are great fits for part-time. And I oh, can yeah. tell you from experience, they last a lot longer. Profile your applicants. You know, you do it for your customers, I'm sure. Hopefully do it oh, for yeah. your customers. But profile your applicants and make sure that coming in, you're able to meet their basic needs. Everybody's are a little different, but that is something you can determine in the interview process. What, you know... And it's not so much of which now some states you can't ask for their previous salary. Like our, in Ohio, you cannot ask what they made at a previous job. Uh -huh. um, we caveat that you can ask what their salary requirements are. And a lot of businesses get pushy on that, stresses out applicants. Um, so you kind of just state what you can pay. You're yeah. more than likely a flat hourly rate for uh, your entry level cleaning positions, which makes it super easy to say this is what we pay everybody. Um, this is if somebody wants more or needs more, they're not a fit. That's fine. Um, but, you know, when you have that rate, you can tell from the beginning when they're taught when you're talking to them about the rate, you can gauge by their reaction pretty quickly if that's going to be a break it or break it. If yeah. they're in a rush for a job, they might take your job to tie them over until they can get a different one. Yep. Um, so you have to keep an eye on those because you're setting yourself up for failure if you hire somebody like that. So, Well, it's a really good point, and I'm glad you bring it up, too, is because – and this is one thing that I don't think a lot of people understand. And so I'm glad that um, you kind of, um, you kind of uh, led the horse to water uh, is that, you know, custodial work especially – is not only physically challenge, uh, uh, challenging, it's very mentally challenging as well. And so a lot of times I think people come in with this expectation of, oh, it's cleaning, it's easy and anybody can do it. And what people don't realize is cleaning is actually very challenging. It's the highest, uh, or excuse me, it's one of the highest um, job demographics with, with, uh, that, that is injured on the job. Um, you know, and I think a lot of it is because, um, you know, everybody kind of assumes anybody can be a cleaner. Uh, people don't realize that cleaning, you know, a uh, 50,000 square foot uh, uh, building is a lot different than cleaning, uh, you know, a thousand square foot home or, or 2000 square foot home. And it, it really, it, you know, especially with things, just basic things like um, tools that are, uh, are more ergonomic, uh, and, and routes that are a little bit simpler, 
um, can, can make it simplified. But even that is a thing that most cleaning operations struggle with. So not only do you have like this perfect storm of uh, physically demanding work, uh, you also have um, people, you know, you also have a situation where um, a lot of times people assume that anybody can do the cleaning. And so, and so what you, so, you know, couple that up as well as we have an aging workforce um, in the cleaning industry. And so it's not uncommon for me to go into the field and do training with, with teams of people that have been in the operation, you know, um, kind of, as you said, either they started at a part-time thing and it was a second job after retire or a job after retirement. Uh, but then they would like go that, you know, then they went from part-time to a full-time equivalent. Um, and so, it, and it's not uncommon for me to train people that have been in that role for 20, 30 years. And they've seen every, they've seen every new thing that's come down uh, from, you know, from the, from management, they've heard every new theory. They've seen every fresh faced kid that came in to train them uh, on how to do this stuff. And, and so you also, you know, so you also have to break through that level of mistrust with people. Um, and the real, the real thing that I'm starting to see, um, a lot recently is that that older generation that has been doing the cleaning historically, um, is either retiring, getting, or getting injured or not coming back is there's this new generation now of people that are coming in and it's very young. Um, it's, it's kind of wild actually. Like I, I, uh, did a thing, uh, just last week, it was a big all hands meeting. And I was very like, I was almost like, I had to like kind of recheck myself because there, there were just as many young folks, meaning younger than me, as there were people that were older than me. Um, and usually I'm used to being in this situation, being one of the youngest people in the room. And so that's kind of a new thing. And I think people engage with cleaning on that, especially on, on, that, uh, on that operational side, especially people that are doing entry level. Uh, the thing that I'm starting to see is, is they're coming in and there's no, like, like I said, it's all generational, it's all tribal knowledge and they're coming in and there's nothing and there's nothing for them. And so the things that are washing them out is they come in and they see what the closets look like. They see what the equipment looks like. They see how much stuff they have to toggle. And, you know, I could show you some pictures sometime of what I see when I go out into the world. That might be kind of fun. Um, but, you know, it's so overwhelming. And if you look at what they have to come into, like nobody wants to go and work in a situation like that. So even making sure that logistically you're setting up your operation that presents a professional image, meaning this is a place where we're going to send caring messages about the equipment we give you, the spaces that we occupy. Um, this is, and they seem very small and simple, but I spent probably a good 60% of my consulting work just getting these places, these pieces into place with large operations, getting all the old broken stuff out. Uh, custodians will find a way. If something breaks, uh, uh, they'll duct tape it together. Um, and because there's been a message at some point that there's not enough budget to upgrade tools or buy new things. And that's nationwide. I mean, that's, I wish there was a better, uh, you know, I wish there was a better mechanism for communicating that to people, but by and large, they're so distrustful. And then people get married to it. It just turns into this very fascinating, like, uh, you know, this very fascinating dynamic that people, um, feel like they can't ask for new things because it's a disciplinary thing or, to, or that directions haven't been clear. And so one of the biggest things uh, that, you know, especially when it comes to retention that I tell people is be very clear about what the physical demands are for the work, um, which is, you know, I mean, if you can't lift 20 to 30 pounds, um, you maybe should you know, you maybe should reevaluate what you're trying to do with, you know, uh, or who you're trying to hire. If a person, you know, can't be on their feet walking throughout, throughout a full-time shift, then maybe we ought to reevaluate, um, you know, uh, who are, who are trying to recruit or who are trying to recruit. Now, before I say anything else, I mean, this isn't, you know, uh, I, I have worked with people who find work with, uh, for people with disabilities, missing, you know, limbs, deployed war fighters coming home, people with mental, uh, or excuse me, intellectual disabilities, uh, people with uh, emotional disabilities and people with physical ones and cleaning, and they take very well to uh, cleaning work, uh, but you do have to have some, some clear expectations. And I think by and large, that's the biggest mistake that I see is people don't set that very clear expectation from the get-go. And that's why we end up, you know, uh, and that's why we end up with retention issues.
Right. It's that expectation than finding the fit. Because some people, like I yep. said, are going to be desperate for money. So they might not choose for themselves to mm -hmm. walk away from the position. But you do have to decide. Um, you know, you have a very physically demanding job. And you have one that is more than likely going to be extremely repetitive and gritty. Yep. And um, you're going to deal with, like, stuff. Like, you might have uh, have to look at somebody and really figure out – can they handle being around like the chemicals and things? And, yeah. you know, if they're worried about breaking their nail 24 seven, this may not be the job for them. Um, and listen, I love my nails, but like, <laughs> so I get it, but like, you know, yeah. they might be desperate for money and with uh, a world right now where people are really trying to find that, find that fit with a position that's not going to ruin them. Sometimes you do have to look and see is the person before you just trying to find the next job to get them by right. until they give up on it or are they somebody who is you know uh going to fit because there are a lot of people out there who really love the type of work where they can get good at doing the process yep and be really good at it. the downside as you kind of touched upon they tend to get very attached to their processes and the machinery they work with and they don't like change yep. so you have to kind of combat that because you're going to have natural ebb and flow of things changing hopefully you know yeah. <laughs> um but at the same time somebody who leans a little more in that way in personality is going to be a better fit for the position than somebody who wants uh you know something mentally engaging every day it's yeah. going to be a different type of work you know they're maybe going to be wanting to work in computers and doing stuff like that that gives them that mental challenge um yeah you know it's funny what what i find too is once you start you know, once you turn that piece around is, and once you really set the daily expectation uh, for a cleaning department uh, of what you want it to perform every day, what you expect it to be able to perform every month. One of the things that I really think is, is healthy for most cleaning organizations is to actually physically show the impact that the department is having. And, and it can be very simple. I actually write about it. Um, I wrote about it in, in my column this month for um, facility cleaning decisions. Um, you know, doing things like um, like like shaking out filter uh, vacuum filters every couple of hours and saving those and weighing them at the every week just so people can see, like especially your people can see. Um, what they're actually doing, because a lot of times I think people, um, you know, are told to go in, get it done and get it done quickly and stay out of people's way. And that's the level of instruction that they get. And I think when you start actually showing people the level of impact they're having, they start caring a lot more about it. And that's the thing is, is I think by and large cleaning has been treated as uh, everybody knows how to do it when really not everybody knows how to do it. There's a science to it. There's, you know, you have to engineer a process. You have to engineer a process that's going to deliver a consistent result every day. And I'd like to say that we're there as a profession, but the fact that I'm still in business tells me that we've still got a lot of work to do, um, you know, and that's okay um, because I look forward to the time, um, you know, when we can look at other things like, um, you know, continuous process improvements and things like that. Um, you know, just getting getting a well-defined process into a cleaning operation is, you know, is, is, is a huge challenge for most because, um, uh, you know, most people have been, been left to their devices a lot of times and had to figure it out on their own. And I say a lot of these things. And a lot of times I get like, uh, people who say, well, you're just being critical. Well, no, I'm just telling you what I've seen in the mm -hmm. field and what I've had to help people overcome. And the, you know, it's one thing, regardless of operation size, the problem is the same. And I see it everywhere I go. And it's not just schools. It's not just higher ed. It's also industrial. It's BSCs. Everybody's got the same problem is there's no kind of uh, standard level of expectation. Um, and, you know, if, if you can't provide that for your people, um, your competitors can't and employers down the road can't. But the one thing about cleaning is it's in every building. It's one of the only professions that's like in every single building. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, by and large, you know, um, you know, there's kind of this very chaotic thing. And so getting it well-defined, I think is a big help. I think giving people specific training, like as simple as it sounds, 
Um, most people don't even get that and they don't get refresher and by and large, when they do get training, it's because somebody has sold a new machine or a new piece of equipment or a new, what have you. And by and large, that's the training they're getting is how to run the machine or how to use the equipment or, or things like that. But that, you know, turning on a machine and being able to run it down a path isn't a process. It's just understanding how to operate it. And I think that that's really, um, that's really where the disconnect is, is understanding where that fits into your daily, to your daily cleaning process. Right. I would say the thing I've noticed, and it, it goes far beyond the industry is that Mm. ongoing training is not something many businesses are good at. Um, people will say they have ongoing training, but usually what that means is, well, we train our leaders when we see an opportunity that could also be a networking event or yes. um, it's free <laughs> yes, uh, or somebody brings it up and the team's a little too excited to tell them, no, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons uh, why we don't. Um, and the biggest is we just, we prioritize immediate production over uh, enabling people to do their best. Yes. And I think that's kind of how you have to see it is, you are prioritizing immediate production that could fall off at any point because of morale versus training to enable. And yes. we, you know, the other thing is too, when it comes to retention, when it comes to people, um, understanding people, having a pulse on how people are doing. I think I'm very fortunate that I feel like I know a lot of people in our company very well and I know how people feel at any given time. Yep. Um, and one thing I can say is there's ebbs and flows of morale and there's uh, like linchpins that cause it. There's, you know, people who are really good. Uh, for example, when you work at a high turnover position and you bring in that one person who doesn't mind the menial, repetitive ta- nature of the job, but has right. an infectious personality that you'll notice she likes to carry it along. And the retired teachers are very good at this for some reason. Yes. Working with yes. children who are moody for some reason make people very good at picking up morale. Um, and they they tend to be those people who can't figure out how to stop working after they retire too. So you find them in a lot of uh, these part-time jobs afterwards. Yeah. Um, they're a great demographic to look at, you know, for these types of positions where you might need a part-timer um, or maybe you want a full timer who, you know, they retire, they're retiring later now, but they, uh, yeah. they still retire. Or they're taking a second job like this. They'll work a day. And a lot of times, actually, I'm working with people who are like mm-hmm. working a full day job and then they'll come in at night for four hours. I mean, that's, that's real common. Um, right. Even you if know, it's like so once or twice a week. Yeah. 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 And so there's kind of this old, you know, this old, uh, we'll take what we can get, um, you know, and it's true because, you know, cleaning has been historically uh, one of the very, you know, one of the harder jobs or one of the harder uh, jobs to keep, uh, to keep non-vacant. Um, but, you know, that's the bigger thing that um, I'm seeing now is retention is one thing, but you have this retiring aging workforce, but then it's like, how do you recruit? And that's the thing that I'm actually seeing a lot more organizations kind of struggle with is, how do we recruit? Meaning, how do we make this, you know, how do we make this attractive to people who um, have the option to do gig work or who have the option to, you know, make more and work uh, and not work as hard um, because, you know, other other companies uh, or other businesses aren't, you know, are, are taking entry level uh, work, which by and large cleaning is, is considered that, but can't pay it or but can pay better. And so, you know, that's one of the bigger things that as well that I'm starting to see. And so it's really, you know, I think it all boils down to it again is, is, you know, where are you going to be able to give humans um, a chance to feel like they're achieving something and succeeding with it? And one of the things that I think every business should do, not just cleaning is, is goal setting is huge. I mean, and not just like dopey goals, I call them dopey goals, but like, oh, we're going to grow by 20%. Well, okay. What does that mean though? And like, maybe, you know, maybe one of the goals is we're going to hit training benchmarks. We're going to hit, you know, we're going to hit internal milestones. um, And we're going to recognize people when we do hit those, because, you know, that's one thing that 
you know, um, when you make people, uh, you know, a big part of your brand and a big part of what you're trying to do, um, you know, they become indispensable. And so being sure that you're doing things that are educating them very specifically into, into other arenas or making them feel indispensable to you by training them on these things is really one of those things. It's, it, it, it's a fun, it, it's a really big carrot to dangle. And so, um, you know, there's some things there. The training has to be meaningful. Um, it can't be just, you know, I call it check off the box training, um, where you sit through a thing and everybody, okay, I took it and we check off boxes and we all agree that we sat through it. Um, but it has to be engaging. And then the other thing I think, um, is a lot of training programs stay static. And so, you know, the one thing that I do, that I do think is big is keeping those materials updated every two or three years. Huge. Yeah. It's huge for people. Because you're not inundating them with um, old stuff, and you're and you're advancing the memory of your of your uh, of your culture that way. Right, and I, you know, I've I've seen a lot of different stuff on um, when you're doing like old trainings and stuff. It's usually based off of old data, and one of the mm -hmm. things with data, um, today's society is not very data literate. Um, nope. And one of the biggest things with data is context and where it's pulled from, when it's pulled from, under what conditions and things like that. So if you're pulling old data it and using that to, to support your claim to old training is you're probably doing nothing. You might actually be um, overlooking newer things that your employees figured out on their own and completely yeah. leaving better options in the dust. Um, but, you know... I, there's there's so many ways we can touch on this. One of the things, you know, you're talking about meaningful training that I've noticed working with anybody is that um, in the goal setting thing too, is you can bring up what your goals are for the position and what you mm -hmm. would like to see. Uh, but it means nothing if you have no idea how they feel, what they want to see, um, and what kind of training they would like to do. Because if you ask them, they're going to tell you. And most of the time, especially the longer they're in a position, their goals aren't going to actually be that different from your own. But it's going nope. to come from theirs. Um, not every employee should be doing the same training, too. This might get a no. little hard um, because you have to really put thought into interacting with the people in your company. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know socializing is hard. I get that, <laughs> but it is. But um, you know, and you can it do is it hard. In a way that's meaningful, uh, right? Right. And this is one thing too. You can't, as a business leader, you can't be everywhere. And the bigger your company no. gets, the harder this gets. But that's where you utilize the networks throughout your company to figure out who's who and where people could be. Is like even when I'm talking to our corporate trainer or our administrative coordinator, trying to get people engaged just in our community. Because one of the things we've been prioritizing is doing stuff other than work. Yeah. Um. You know, is talking to our other leaders in our company and saying, "Hey, you know, if you'd like to see somebody more engaged or somebody that you think would be good to do these kinds of social activities we're doing, let me know. I'll reach out to them directly. I don't mind that, but." Like, I can't see everybody. I can't see the remote people most of all because most of my time goes to in office. Yeah. But that, and I, I don't have to. But also, it's one of those system setting things is create a process, create clear expectations on yep. how do you take your team? Like, if you're a, a direct supervisor, how do, what kind of things should you be watching about your team? Uh, even training your supervisors on social and body leak use to see that they can pick up a morale and if they have somebody who's struggling a bit more one week than they ever have before being able to attune to that and help yeah help say hey what's wrong what's going on anything we can help with goes a huge long way and then being able to say well you know this person is having trouble adjusting to these new processes let's yeah. get them some new one-on-one -on -one training we're going to make it subtle so they don't feel singled out but like let's enable them to do the best they can yeah. No, I think it's, you know, and it's a very important piece that you bring up, especially is, is, you know, usually, you know, usually with that, especially is, uh, especially with new process, especially with building new processes around those things. Um, people, 
and this is one of the things my father used to be very like big on saying people will do things for their reasons, not for yours. And so, you know, the, the real, the real trick is figuring out the, what's in it for me, for other people. Um, and so what's gonna, you know, what's gonna make people want to do this? What's going to make them want to change? What's going to make them want to do this over what we were doing before. And, you know, I, I think not only with, um, you know, not only with seeing where people are maybe averse to change, uh, but also being, uh, you know, being in tune with um, what are going to be those triggers for them uh, to push back on it. And being, a, and, and, you know, I think the other thing too is, and I see this a lot, especially in custodial, is a lot of people don't have um, a pushback plan, um, is they'll either go, they'll go straight to, um, uh, you know, directives and say, well, we're doing this and you don't have a choice, which is a mood killer, or, um, or, they'll, uh, or they'll just go back to what was going on uh, before. And so, you know, so you've just given control away in one way, or you've just overexerted control in the other. And there's a real happy medium to actually be listen to listen to people where you can actually very subtly bring these types of things in. And the, the way I've always loved doing it is just, well, we think this can happen here. We think we've seen this happen here and here and here. It looks like this when it does happen this way. And we want to, you know, we don't want to push the organization any harder than, than we need to, but we are very interested in seeing who'd be interested in maybe helping us get to this point. And it's, it's always funny to me uh, who raises their hand to participate in that. Uh, because usually the people who I've been told are the biggest like resistors in the organization um, are the people who are raising their hand. And usually the people who I've been told are the biggest rock stars in the organization are the people who kind of go like this. And, you know, it's funny because usually the people who raise their hand and have been resistors have just been waiting for an opportunity like this to come along. And so it's one of those things is no is kind of knowing what what opportunities you can put in front of people that will you know that will make them uh feel like it's safe to rise to the challenge and when you do it voluntary uh, that's the thing i think a lot of times people don't do it is there's this tendency to talk around the cleaning department um, and talk around the people that are doing the cleaning i think by and large um when you say we think we're going to do this our goal for doing this is achieving you know uh working you know smarter, not harder. We're, you know, you, you know, we're not trying, we're, you know, we're going to put better tools in your hands. We're going to uh, actually get this building cleaner. We're going to clean all the closets out and give you, you know, give you closets that are actually functional. Just kind of like seeing what those carrots are, because what, what you'll end up doing is actually opening up for feedback. Like, oh, well, you know, the boss wants us to start over here every night, but if we do that, it actually takes longer and then we can't get through. And since this area doesn't get used every day, I mean, you just start in, you know, you just engage, um, you know, you just engage very, uh, you know, very meaningful, um, you know, like you said, data gathering in a way that's non, non-confrontational for workers. Um, and that's the other thing is people don't argue with their own data. So you got to be really careful with what you put in front of them. Um, and I do agree that, um, you know, sometimes you can inundate people to the point where um, you dump so much stuff in front of them, they don't know what to do with those numbers. Um, so the data uh, needs to be meaningful to the people that are doing the work. Hey, you know, we went from you using, you know, 60 different chemicals in this building a month ago to we're down to only 12. I mean, these are things to, that people, you know, that people really feel if they can feel like they're a part of it will really, uh, in my experience, they'll jump on board with it and they'll, they'll feel like they're actually part of solving a major institutional problem, which is everywhere. So, Right. And one of the things that like, I'm seeing throughout this conversation is there's conversation happening. Like, put your, put your, your top leaders in front of everybody at some point yep. or another, like, have that conversation, like even just going out to the job and talking to the people doing it. Oh my gosh. Amazing what happens. Well, and yeah. they're like, well, they're going to come to me for everything. No, they're not. You, you work with people because I have people that come to me for random things yeah. and you just tell them, hey, you know, so-and-so is handling this. You take this to them. But hey, I want to talk to you about these closets. I noticed they seem a bit busy. Um, yeah. You're going to get a pulse, but also like 
they're going to feel like they help make that change happen. If they're, it's theirs, they own it. Um, and then they tend to carry other people along. Um, a lot of those people, a lot of those resistors to change, they're those people who like to lead naturally, even if it's subtle. And so they like, I mean, they're like me, they like to be in control of the situation. Um, they find some kind of joy or, um, satisfaction in that. And so if you're getting them to come along and be a powerhouse for your effort versus, um, trying to pick them up later on the cart, they're not going to want to go. They're not, they're not bad wagon people. Um, so I, it's just, it's very interesting. It's one thing, you know, you have to think of it, uh, like any other time when you're involving people, when you're going, um, to get something done is that they're dynamic. They're interesting. You can't always bring everybody along. Sure. But, um, you can definitely do a lot of things that make a huge difference in your culture and your morale. Um, and you know, if you're meeting people's basic needs with your job, with like paying them enough to get by and your benefits are good enough, um, you know, and those things, the biggest thing, people want to work with their friends and they want to work with people they trust. So if you can get the yeah. rest of those ducks in a row, it's going to, you know, fill out. Well, it, it is, it is. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, you, the whole, the whole goal is to get people to that self-actualization. I mean, that's the whole goal. And so you start simply with things like, you know, uh, with things that are tangible to people, things like, you know, uh, tools and people to do the job, you know, you, then you move up to things like safety and training and, you know, and then you move up to recognition and appreciation for achieving safety milestones, achieving, you know, training milestones. And then you get right up to that, like, Hey, I can do this piece. And that's really, really what, you know, you know, what, uh, what drives a whole lot of, um, uh, you know, retention issues. And, and, and it's one thing, like, you know, there's some companies that, um, and some institutions that I work with that went from, you know, three different people on a team, you know, every year to, you know, you know, we've got lifers on there now. And by lifers, I mean, people who have been in the organization longer than a decade. And those people start moving up into the organization. That's when it gets really fun, because the whole thing with cleaning, um, the one thing that I really have been, um, you know, that I think is big is I would love to see, uh, you know, a nice career ladder for people who come in doing the cleaning work, you know, who can climb past and go into even branch out into other parts of an organization um, or, or ascend a leadership in, in the cleaning one. And it's one that, you know, you just used to have to kind of wait out and I'm starting to see that not happening so much. It's actually people, you know, once they're, you know, once they're in tune with what they can and can't do, um, it turns into a very, you know, uh, it, it turns be into a beyond the thing for like, you know, pride and esteem, but an actual, no, this is a trade and I know it. Yeah, no, I would agree. And there's going to be people who are perfectly content to stay in that job forever. I think that's mm-hmm. always interesting as you find people who they just like that work and they just want to be appreciated in that work. Um, and then. It, it, every person's different, but I definitely think it's interesting. I've heard a lot of people talk about the ability to climb in this industry from doing, uh, like you said, you started by cleaning in schools and I, being able to climb I, the ladder. And Yeah, I never thought I'd be doing this, honestly. Like I started at 14, my first job was I was a sweeper in a high school. And I never in a million years thought I would be working as a consultant, as a trainer, as an educator, as a columnist. It just, um, you know, I think everybody kind of arrives to it, you know, by accident. And I think that uh, myself included, and that's, that's one of the things is if you can commit yourself fully, uh, you know, to leaving it better and, and doing the most work you can for the community of people that you serve, I think that that's really you know, that's really when we start getting into some cool stuff. And I think, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's been interesting for me to see, you know, the demographic shift over the past couple of years, especially, um, you know, I'm working with a lot of young folks now, people that are younger than me. I'm not used to that. I'm used to going into a room full of people that are a lot older than me. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to teach those guys anything new, no matter how much, you know, no matter how hard I try. But the nice, the interesting thing is, is 
there's this new demographic and the need is, hasn't changed. That's the difference. The need hasn't changed. And we have an opportunity to make an impact on that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think, you know, it's interesting, but even with, I've worked with an older group of people too, and I think they can be very interesting in that, um, again, the approach of enabling versus um, just teaching. Like, I feel like sometimes Yep. when we say teaching, we feel like we're just throwing knowledge at people um, a lot because Yeah. that's what we've, we've built some systems out to do. But I think the big thing is enabling that those people um, want to be in a position to teach at that stage in their life. And they definitely can be. Um, so you almost want to make them feel like they are teaching themselves so they can teach others and they will do Yeah. very well. A lot of the times, everybody's different, but that's been my experience. No, Um, it's, I think it's, I think it's a very important observation that you make. And that's, that's the way that I used to have to do it is I'm not going to teach you anything. You're going to teach me some stuff. Like you're going to teach me something new and we'll find out where the common ground is there. And when you can enable people to use their experience to, you know, to add depth to something that you were trying to bring into the organization, that's when you really start having big successes. Mm -hmm. I like when I have mixed groups too, when Mm-hmm. you're, you're talking about, you have groups of varying age groups. I love to pair together unlikely people. And I used to do simple, like icebreakers. People always laugh at icebreakers. I made mine as awkward and cringy as possible. And some people just let it go. And it was always funny because you have the shy little 16 year old who Yeah. is in a group of people they don't know, um, outside their comfort zone. And, uh, you know, you go around, they don't know. I always say, you have to tell me one thing that's interesting about you and one place you've never, your favorite place you've never been. And so, you know, they can usually come up with the favorite place they've never been. Uh, sometimes they think they're not interesting. And then you get somebody on the other side of the table, uh, you know, they're retired from doing this or that or the other. And they say, no, no, there's something interesting. And then you get to the random little quiet person in the corner who skydived 16 times. Yep. And that gets everybody talking. Um, well, then suddenly the teenager who was shy actually goes snowboarding and... did a com competition last winter, you know, like it's, and then when you actually get to the education part, it's so much easier. Cause then you kind of nudge those people towards each other that, and you say, Hey, can you guys figure out this? And they Yes. have to figure it out, but you're really leading them to what you need them to learn. Well, and there's, that's this, the best part about it is like, it's like that old uh, kindergarten style of instruction. Uh, round tables is a big thing for me. I like putting people at round tables because facilitating interaction and solving problems as a group is how we learned in kindergarten. Mm My Mm -hmm. Well, what's funny is uh, you said the, the kindergarten round table style, right? favorite. <laughs> I, I We did these anti-bullying things where they took the fifth graders and had them teach anti-bullying messaging twice a week to kindergartners. So I did that because, you know, I loved doing all the little extra stuff at school. I always had kids wanting to be in my group, my little class, right? I had kids that, like, we'd rotate them because of... Uh, different scheduling conflicts or whatever, you know, there'd always be changes. Um, 
and they'd always pull a kid out of mine and put a different kid in, which is always funny because I saw that the most, but that's because kids wanted to be in my group. And so I'd have kids that come over and talk to me. But the funny thing is it's, if it's a social thing and they're friends first, which, you know, sometimes we want to separate work and friends, mm -hmm. but if you, if you're not working with people you like, you're going to be miserable and that's where your turnover kicks back in. And so if you can do something like, my favorite thing is if I see somebody who's shy and hasn't connected yet, but has a lot of potential is I love to nudge the overly social one who doesn't think they're social towards them because yeah. they're going to pick them up and carry them along back to everybody else. And once they have friends there, you know, all those little like hardships that make the day drag a bit longer or make things seem a lot bigger and more stressful than they are start to fall away. Yes. So got to break down the resistance. That's one of the best ways to do it. Right. Right. So I mean, we've talked a lot about, um, I'm going to start to wrap us up now okay. uh, because I think you and I can keep going for a long time. We can we'll, go for hours. Yeah. So let's go ahead. And I mean, I think we have said a lot and we'll have a lot of, um, good opportunity to kind of jump back and touch base, I think, again on this at some point. Yeah, oh um, yeah. For now, though, it, we've given people a lot of food for thought on retention and kind of really the real underlying uh, things to focus on when it comes to retention. Because I've done a couple episodes where we focus on um, sometimes the more technical businessy side of it, which is important. Yeah. But uh, really, we got at the root cause today, and I think that's hugely important. I do, too. I think there's a lot of things you can do to look at metrics and things like that. Um, I think that, you know, people do like to have the, make the business case for it mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, how expensive turnover is, what it's costing your organization, how to, you know, how to have processes and things like that in place. I always come at it, and maybe it's just because I'm a simple fella. Um, I always come at it from the human piece um, because people who you believe in and people who feel like you believe in them will stick around. And, you know, it's one of those things like, you know, we make jokes about like the pizza parties and things like that. Um, but really having tangible goals for people to reach and not just HR goals, like we're going to really, you know, we're going to achieve something as an organization or as a department. And recognizing people and really taking the time to do it. The industry has gotten a lot better about it in the past couple of years. Uh, but for me, it's very important to see cleaners getting recognition for a job that's really hard, uh, that used to be invisible, uh, and that a lot of people are quote unquote experts in, but nobody ever talks like stops to talk to the people who are actually doing the work to get any insight on their expertise. And it's one of the things that I really um, have had to learn how to do is like, sometimes you just got to shut up and listen to like what they're saying to you. Um, and you'll find that, um, you know, that's just been being, you know, um, you know, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but it really works. And so I find that the, the more you take the time to listen to, to your crew and the more you take time to acknowledge and appreciate their input and their feedback, um, it goes a long way. It goes a long way for what you're trying to do. And instead of competing with um, the job market over salary, um, you're making your culture compete with salary, which I think is, you know, one of the things that you can really, you know, kind of turn tables on if you're if you're struggling to keep uh, uh, keep and retain employees. Well, and if you think about it long term and you think if I can get my culture morale up, if I can retain people and decrease the cost of retention, and um, you know, I'm working with the same people, so you're going to increase your efficiency and your effectiveness over time. If you're working on improving the same people versus training fresh people every time, you're going to start to turn around, not to mention you're probably going to make your customers a lot happy. Yep. Um, your bottom line is going to improve, which means eventually, you're going to start to be able to offer much more competitive pay. Um, but it's something that's going to have to come with, you've done the work to get there by prioritizing people first. Yep. So. Competitive pay, professional tools, uh, better working environments. I mean, these are all things that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that cleaning workers take notice of. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in, in alignment with you on that. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on today, Ben. And this is fun. 
This is fun. I've had a lot yeah. of fun. I think um, for everybody who's listening, you probably don't know how long we've actually been talking on here. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely revisit this issue uh, or opportunity, rather, opportunity oh, yeah. for growth in the future. But in the meantime, I'm going to be providing a great uh, blog article to coincide with this. So Ben's going to have to give it a read and let me know what he thinks from the writing sure. perspective. Sure. Sure. Um, but I'll also provide uh, information on Ben and his contact info, as well as uh, a full transcript of the episode. So you'll have to give that a check it, check it out and uh, listen again, because I'm sure you kind of want to dive a little deeper into what we've talked about today. Um, have a great month, and we will see you next.